Hello, everybody. This is uh, Ben Hobbs. Welcome back to the Market Surveillance Committee meeting. And I'm with uh, Jim Bushnell and Scott Harvey. And this afternoon, we're going to start off with um, uh, price performance, in particular the report that uh, uh, Guillermo and his colleagues have uh, put together on the topic. Um, part of the impetus of this was um, an opinion that uh, we wrote uh, last, win last winter. And I'm um, very much looking forward to a discussion of this uh, in-depth analysis of uh, various pricing issues. So, Guillermo, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and I hope I have voice through the end of the presentation. I just got a cold. And um, I think we have discussed this in different forums, and indeed we have discussed this previously in the MSC uh, meeting. The way we organize the presentation is not to go through every detail and metric that we developed through the analysis. Instead, it's just to come with a summary of the findings and the potential solutions and kick off the discussion of what this could be. Uh, the report is available, and I think there are just too many metrics to try to cover some of those here. And I will just highlight the main points and go through the discussion of what we might potentially be doing to to overcome those challenges. Uh, as you, as you may recall, we initiated this uh, analysis. Uh, based on several concerns. One of those was obviously the concerns expressed by the MSC during the uh, opinion related to the intertide deviation initiative. And they were pointing specifically to some price and uh, formation issues related to intertides. So we committed publicly with the stakeholders that we would take on a more formal process to go through the analysis and evaluation of the price performance of the ISO market and specifically wanted to analyze the price performance and how that aligned with the system conditions that were observed during that time in the market. We wanted to analyze also the price divergence or convergence in the market across the different markets. One of the key points that the MSC specifically, Scott, was pointing out was related to the effectiveness of the flexible ramping product. And obviously, a big component was also the concerns from participants about the potential effect of the operator's interventions in the market outcome, including the, uh, the price performance. Uh, the report basically tries to cover all these angles. And as you can see, there are many different areas that the report tried to look for and tried to come with uh, identification of potential issues. So along that uh, analysis, we tried to cover the specific concerns that were raised by the MSC. And we pointed out to specific cases. And I think there is a disclaimer that we need to make, and that is by the time the MSC expressed their opinion in written, and we provided data prior to that, that data has some mischaracterization of the manual interface on manual dispatches on the interties, and that basically led the MSC to an opinion that was not reflective of that data. I think prior to the BOG, that data was corrected, and when we do the analysis, basically we took the, the clean data and we analyzed the outcomes that were pointed by the MSC, and we indeed observed that the prices closely aligned with the conditions that were expected to see in the market. Uh, how did we approach this analysis? Uh, we always have this dilemma. If we start analyzing the market from a 30,000 feet view, we will be able to analyze trends, see patterns, but we may come short to specifically identify what's going on. On the other end, we can go and analyze specific instances, specific market intervals to, to know exactly what happened. But then the challenge is how we can expand that to and generalize it across the longer period. So in that case, what we did is typically what we do for any other type of analysis is to take both approaches. First, we wanted to go and analyze two and a half years of performance of the pricing in the market. And from that, we can see patterns, trends, and we can grasp what may be going at the system level. From there, we can actually identify some specific cases that now we want to deep dive and start analyzing specifically what was going on with those specific cases. 
So the analysis that you're going to find in the report has these two words of analytical approaches, and they are complementary to each other. Uh, one of the complications that uh, we have to overcome has to do with the fact that we cannot recreate a parallel world of what would have been if something else happened in the market. Uh, we do have capability to rerun some market specifically for certain intervals, certain days, in isolation, in a vacuum. But we are not able to recreate in a sequencing fashion exactly what would have been the market outcome if we were able to rerun the market with different inputs or different conditions. It's just not feasible. So in many of the cases that we have in the report, we have this type of analysis of a counterfactual analysis. What if we take out the, the operator's actions and see what would have been the resulting prices? What if we didn't have the load conformance, the exceptional dispatches included in the market? What would have been the resulting prices? Yeah, these are interesting to see how the interplay goes in terms of price and the effect of those actions. But again, we need to be very cautious how far we can take those uh, at, at, full, at, at full phrase because it's in a very controllable, isolated fashion that doesn't replicate the, the timing and the sequencing nature of our markets. Uh, through the different areas of the report, you're going to find that we have this type of uh, different approaches to analyze different areas of the market. And uh, the reality is that uh, when we analyze pricing performance in general, there are just too many factors at play in impacting a specific market outcome. Uh, we can know specifically what was the effect of an input of a operator action, but at the end of the day, we cannot just generalize that across the board because there are just too many factors at play. And they are going to have a competing, conflicting, or overlapping effect in the market solution. On one end, for instance, you may have exceptional dispatches applied to the market that basically brings more capacity, more energy to the system. At the same time, you may have load conformance that basically is pushing up the, the price stack of the bit stack of the supply. And the net effect, you don't know what is going to be, whether that is going to result in a higher or lower price depending on which one has a more dominant effect. So there are just too many factors at play that it's almost impossible to analyze in isolation what is specifically the effect of one of those at a time. And this is what makes this type of analysis interesting because at the end of the day we have to like, dissect what are the main components and the main drivers for, for this thing. Uh, through the report you're going to find an uh, almost infinite amount of cases that we analyzed. And I think the approach was to try to group them into common themes, common areas of the market. And we discussed internally what could potentially be the solutions for overcoming those uh, challenges that we have. Uh, what you have here in front is a summary of the main findings that we have from the report, from the analytical phase, and some potential uh, solutions or at least some potential vehicles to tackle and discuss what the solutions could be. And I will try to go through each of those in more detail in the subsequent slides. Uh, the first one, uh, this has to do a lot with the convergence from the day ahead to the real time frame. Uh, we know that conditions change naturally every time you have sequencing of markets. One market is going to capture certain conditions that naturally are known at that time. As you start moving and progressing towards the real time, the conditions may change, the, the factors may be different, and naturally the subsequent markets are going to potentially be running with a slightly different set of inputs and conditions that rightfully are just capturing the most immediate uh, conditions known by the time the market has to run. Uh, the, the important piece here is that in the recent years, with the introduction of renewables, one of the main components that we have been dealing with has to do with the variability, the uncertainty that happens from the day ahead to the real time. Uh, that variability, in turn, has a lot of implications of how we can actually position the system and how operators have to handle real-time conditions. Ideally, we want to have a vehicle that give us the tools, the elements that we need in order to position properly the market towards the real time. 
the main um, driver that lead to this uncertainty and this variation between the day ahead and the real-time markets has to do a lot with the variation of the three main components that we have. That is the load, the wind, and the solar resources. Uh, there are days that, as we discussed in the report, that just going from the day ahead towards the real-time frame, we are talking in, for about less than 24 hours, you can have variations of more than 2,000 megawatts of the load, the load forecast. And to all justice related to the forecasting, it's not just a problem of the forecasting. It's a problem of the inherent nature of the system. Uh, there were certain days, for instance, in the summer, where by the time we have to do the forecasting in the day ahead time frame, towards the load forecast that we have to do for the real time, you have a variation of 2,700 megawatts, and that variation was mainly because we have a 12-degree variation just between the day ahead to the real time. Well, how much can we do to, to improve the, the temperature forecast? There is very little hope there. It is, it is what it is. But instead, what we can do is try to create the mechanisms, the instruments to handle that uncertainty that we know is bound to happen. And the same story happens when you analyze the wind and the solar and forecast for renewable resources. The uncertainty is there. The variation is going to be there. We know that the temperature, the wind, the clouds are going to move very quickly just from the day ahead to the real time frame. The reality is that we know those happen and they will continue to happen. Currently, we do not have an explicit mechanism that allows us to hedge against that uncertainty. The end result is that once we complete the day ahead market, naturally we operators have to think about why, what do I need to do in order to be better prepared for the real time conditions when I know I have to face this type of uncertainty, this type of variation. If they know that historically in the summer they may be off by 2,500 megawatts of load, and if they know that the the solar is going to die suddenly, how can they position the system properly on time so that they can handle this type of uncertainties? That is when a lot of operators' interventions have to come in play. We may have to go, and in preparation for that condition, we may have to go and adjust the load forecast in the rock process to basically make sure that we have enough or sufficient capacity online. We may have to go and exceptional dispatch resources to be able to sustain the ramp that potentially may be steeper than we expected. All these uh, have a manifestation in different actions that we have to take in order to properly position the system for the real-time conditions that we know are bounded to, to change. Uh, this raises really the, the, the linkage between what the uncertainty is versus what elements we have to handle that uncertainty. Again, right now we don't have a formal mechanism, a formal market mechanism to handle that uncertainty. And the manifestation of that is basically operators' actions, exceptional dispatches, load conformance, uh, and rock adjustments in the day ahead in order to create that band, that tolerance band, so that they can handle the, the conditions. You know, just eyeballing this figure, it looks like in, in at least the first quarter of 2019 that the downside uh, uncertainty has, is, is quite a bit smaller than in the other years there. Is that a first quarter effect, or has something happened? Or? I think it has to do more with the seasonality. It's not just apples to apples. That is the reason we wanted to emphasize that it was only Q1. Uh, a better picture would be really a comparison across the different quarters. Mm -hmm. Now, c coming back to this picture, what we illustrate here is that you have a, a blocks whisker plot. In this case, the extremes that are marked by dots are the minimum and the maximum values. There are a small squares somewhere in the middle that basically cover the 10th and the 90th percentile. The dots in red are just the simple averages. And what this is measuring is basically the error of the net loads between the day ahead and the real time. And as you can see in the report, we have different variations of that. It could be the IFM versus FMM, IFM versus RTD, ROC versus FMM, and similarly, uh, ROC versus uh, RTD. Uh, the overall picture, the overall metric remains the same, and that is for any given hour in any given period of the year, you have this white 
band of uncertainty that may happen at any time in the market. And you can see the extreme values can go as high as 6,000 megawatts. So at a given point on time, in a given hour during that year, it means that once you compound the variation of the load, the wind, and the solar, the delta between the day ahead and the real time could be as high as 6,000 megawatts. Well, if you have to deal with that uncertainty, and obviously you have to operate the system to um, make sure that that uncertainty still doesn't put you in a corner, uh, how can you position yourself, uh, how we can position the system to, to be able to absorb that uncertainty that you know is bound to happen? And uh, this uh, basically adds a lot of color of why we have to have all these struggles when we move from the day ahead to the real time. Now, naturally, this is not a new theme. This is not a new discussion that we are initiating here. Uh, the day ahead market enhancement initiative, to a great extent, has tackled this discussion related to the uncertainty that materializes from the day ahead to the real time. Just to, to close the loop on this item, uh, we do have this initiative, and it's a matter of how we're going to eventually come with a solution of what is going to be the market mechanism to, to provide the market, the system, with an instrument, with a vehicle to handle that uncertainty. And uh, I think that initiative is still ongoing, and we don't have a final path yet, but it's an effort that is already undertaken, and naturally that will put us in a place where we are going to have a, a an instrument to, to handle that uncertainty. I would like to see if we have any any questions so far. Yeah, one thing that I thought was really interesting <coughs> in your report, Graham, was you also, in addition to the, the day ahead to uh, to real time, you had a couple of days where you analyzed and you showed how the load forecast anal changed over the day. And because yes. you know it isn't just you know day ahead and rock and then real time. You're, you're running stuck in these other things, and it's a uh, it's a matter of you know, when you see the load forecast changing. And yes. you saw that for particular days, which was interesting. Uh, it might be useful to kind of understand that pattern more generally when yes. you develop these things to understand, you know, how far in advance do we need, you know, will we see these things coming and uh, what kind of units do we need to uh, respond. Uh, and this is a very interesting topic, Scott, because I think we have heard from our operators that the market is moving, right, and they don't have this fixed target to, to achieve. Mm -hmm. That is why we started analyzing this. And what we realized is that, as you said, within the same day, it doesn't have to be from the day ahead to the real time. In a matter of hours, you can see how rapidly the conditions are changing. And obviously, the, uh, for instance, if we take the, as a reference the load forecast, how that forecast is changing in a matter of four hours by a range of 2,000 megawatts in the real time. Every time the 15-minute market runs, is going to take the more recent forecast that is available. And if that forecast is evolving still and progressing towards the peak, and by the time the market, such as a stock that is running four and a half hours in the horizon, has to make the last decision and is the last time to commit the unit to be able to sustain the peak, the market may not have the information readily available to make the right commitment, the right through ups, the right movements of the resources, simply because that information is still evolving. And that poses a challenge because, if you see from the operator side, it is just no more than a moving target. They see that the commitments are moving up and down, that the dispatches are moving up and down just because of this progression of the forecast. Uh, when we, we continue to analyze this from the point of view of the forecasting techniques. And what is interesting is that you can see that, generally speaking, uh, all the information than four hours typically stay the same in a plateau, and usually when it peaks around four or five hours prior to the target time. And that has to do a lot with the techniques that we use between persistency mm -hmm. and blending with the, for, uh, with the methodological conditions. There is, there is a sweet spot in which you have to rely for the forecasting more on the persistency based on the current conditions that you project are going to remain the same. And at some point as you move in the horizon, you need to start blending towards more weather-based conditions. Where that blending happens has to do a lot of how sooner or how later you can project the, the final conditions to be ahead of time. So it's still a challenge. We are trying to see if there is any way we can um, make a stronger that uh, blending that logic to ensure that it is less of a moving target for, for, the, for the final forecast. Thanks.
<clears throat> okay. Uh, a natural complement to this discussion has to do with the fact that we do currently have a mechanism, a market product for the real-time uncertainty. That is no more than the flexible ramping product. And this product is designed to tackle basically the uncertainty that realizes within the real time. It's not intended to cover the uncertainty that goes from the day ahead to the real time, but only within the real time. And we have the product implemented for the 15-minute market, for the 5-minute market, and each one has its corresponding logic of how we come with the requirements. Basically, it's to, uh, to handle the uncertainty that realizes from the 15-minute market to the 5-minute market and between the 5-minute markets. And uh, this design is not only applicable to the KISO balancing area, but also to each of the EAM areas. It's a holistic design for the real-time market. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion in, in the recent years related to the efficiency and how good the performance of the flexible ramping product has been. And this was one of the main areas of concern from the MSC opinion related to intertie deviation and price performance in general of how effective the FRP has been for the real-time market. Uh, we took a specific effort to analyze the, the real-time performance of the FRP, and some of those were not brand new issues. Some of those were actually evaluated and discussed prior to, to this effort. Um, but we just build out on, on those. And these are classified in four different groups that are somehow complementary to each other. The first one is related to the structure that we have for the 15-minute market. Uh, when prior to the implementation of the first order 7, 764, we have a, a very natural structure for the intervals that compose the 15-minute market. We have a 15-minute market uh, made up of 15-minute intervals. We have a horizon for each 15-minute market that depends on the, on, the, on the specific run. There could be an FMM run that has a horizon of four intervals, five intervals, six intervals, or uh, seven intervals. And uh, regardless of that, in the past, we used to have that the first interval of the horizon used to be the binding interval. When we introduce the first order 764, we have to make a tweak in order to ensure that we have enough time for the tagging process. In that way, now what is the second natural interval in the horizon is what becomes the binding interval in, in our market. Effectively, this is the interval that gives us the prices and scales that are used to settle. In that case, this is when we introduce what we call the buffer interval. That is no more than always the first interval of the horizon. In that construct, what you have is, regardless of the length of the horizon, the first interval is buffer, is not used for settlements. The second interval becomes the binding, is used for settlements. And any other subsequent interval is advisory intervals. When we put this logic in place for the flexible ramping product, the natural question is, what is the flexible ramping pro product definition? Well, by definition, the FRP always go from one interval to the other. Therefore, we need to have a requirement that tells me how much FRP I need to go from the buffer interval to the binding interval, from the binding interval to the first advisory, from the first advisory to the second advisory, and so on. So we impose that requirement for every single pairwise of the FMM intervals. The logic that we currently have is such that we do have a requirement enforced to go from the binding interval to the first advisory, and that is the FRP associated with the binding interval. When we move, if you keep that time frame, and now we move 15 minutes later for the subsequent run, what used to be the binding interval now becomes the buffer interval. Well, we currently don't have a requirement enforced to go from that buffer interval to what now the first binding interval. What it happens in this case is that given the fact that we impose a requirement to go from the, in the previous run from the binding to the, to the first advisory, we don't carry over that requirement in the subsequent run that corresponds now to the buffer to the first interval. And effectively what it means is that we procure FRP to go in the first run, that would be the upper uh, plot, 
And whatever we procure, basically we can make it available or release it in subsequent FMM runs because we don't have the requirement in the subsequent run enforced. In some cases, what this means is that we may actually release the capacity and then if FMM uses, great, because it used to, to mitigate some uncertainty that realizes in the subsequent FMM. If it doesn't use that all, well, it's, it's gone because you cannot carry over for the RTD. And remember, the, the original intent is that once we procure that in FMM, the ultimate goal is to make sure that we have the capacity available for RTD when the uncertainty realizes. So this is a two-fold picture. In one case, you may have capacity that is released and is no longer used. In the worst case, like in the illustration that we have in the uh, analysis report, it may actually lead to lose certain FRP capacity because in some cases, that capacity was associated with the starting up a unit that now when we release that capacity in the subsequent FMM, that capacity is no longer needed and the resource is no longer started. There is no other opportunity, there is no other time for the market to reprocure that for that time frame. That is gone and basically that capacity is lost. Just so I understand this and maybe this is helpful if anybody else is not on top of this. So I'm just trying to understand the lingo and, and what, when we say intervals here, whether we're solving multiple iterations for the same ultimate period of time sure. or we're solving sort of approximations for sequential 15-minute blocks. And so when you say there's a buffer interval, is, that's, is that a, because I think of advisory as meaning this is where I think you're going to have to be at time X, yes. not sort of this is where the software, you know, is putting you at time X minus one. Um, and so which, which is that? Is, is the buffer interval actually a, a sort of, preliminary solution for the same time frame as the actual binding interval, or is it the previous interval? No, I think the binding interval is done by the time you have to come in the subsequent FMM and solve for the buffered interval. It's already behind you. So when we solve, for instance, right now for interval one, that is the binding interval, we determine what are the final scales and prices that are binding for that interval, that are settlements-wise binding. Fifteen minutes later, when we need to solve for the subsequent interval that now is going to be the binding, we still need to have a solution for the first interval that is the buffer interval because it's the preceding interval to get a solution to what now is the binding interval. It's not an advisor because it's already behind you, but it's a starting point for you to, be, to reach the binding solution of the binding interval. And then the reason you're not just using the solution, the previous binding solution, is because conditions may have changed. Yes. And so we we still reoptimize that first interval. Basically, mm -hmm. we don't take it as given from the previous solution and move from there. It's reoptimizable because it's part of the whole horizon. Is does that reoptimization reflect reality better than the previous solution? It should or? be because it's 15 minutes later. <laughs> and you may have an updated forecast. You may have an updated value of the VR. Yeah, it's but I, I guess I'm trying to understand. It's like 15 minutes later. It's like, man, I really wish I'd ramped that unit instead <laughs> of this one. But that doesn't mean you actually did it. Um, and so, uh, but but it sounds like. The idea is at least that the buffer interval is, is a better approximation of sort of where things are going into the next binding interval yes. than uh, using the previous binding solution. Uh, uh, and, and there is a concept, at least for the 15-minute market, and it has to do with when your instructions become finally binding. For energy predispatches, they are financially binding and they are set in the binding interval. For instance, for commitment decisions, you may continuously re-optimize your commitment decisions. If you have, for instance, to start up a fast start unit that takes seven minutes to start up, and the first time the FMM market decides that that unit may be needed is one hour from now, you are not going to issue this instruction to be binding 
because you still have time to reevaluate and potentially the conditions change 15 minutes later you may no longer need the unit so we give the opportunity to the to the market to reoptimize all these conditions and only issue the instruction when it's the last time it has to be able to send that instruction. And that applies mainly to the, to the commitment. So we allow the market to reoptimize based on the more recent conditions and send the final binding instructions until the last chance it has to, to issue those instructions. Thank you, Jim. Remember that the, the dispatch instructions in FMM are are meaningless because it's actually going to be done in RTD. So like one, reason you're, one reason you're projecting it is because RTD was not paying attention to what, F, what the previous RTPD did. It's looking at actual real-time load. So it, you, you, when you re-optimize, you're sort of saying, well, this is what our, you know, where we'll be because RTD will be moving based on this new forecast. Am I right that the, <coughs> that the, the interchange schedule is fixed? So this buffer interval doesn't change the interchange schedule. It's just affecting the unit commitment decisions? Is that the only thing? The unit commitment, predispatches, and I believe for interties, if it is already, I believe, yes, it's, it's already done. It's yeah. only, I was thinking that there may be some 15-minute resources, but that would be applicable only for the binding interval. Mm -hmm. Just to make sure I understand, so in the buffer interval, you might uh, solve for a different commitment than you did when in the previous run when it was the binding interval. Yes. So the binding, so the binding schedule, then you move forward 15 minutes, and you might make an adjustment when it's the buffer, but there's nothing financially binding there. Mm -hmm. Okay. As long as the, it, the temporary constraints of the resource allows you to do that, it has to be basically these fast starters or right. very fast transitions that you can make within the, the time frame. In general, we don't have too many of those, so what you may see in the binding interval happens to be the final binding dispatch. Okay, okay. so with that as background, um, <laughs> then maybe maybe we can just, you're in the middle of it, but I want to understand what it means to release the flexible ramping capacity in this buffer interval, um, given that the, the buffer interval is really just trying to approximate better what's really going on. Yeah. No ramp. Yeah. The, the main challenge is that when we procure originally the FRP between interval one and interval two, and let's assume interval one is the binding, we impose a requirement that in addition to meeting our energy needs, we need to have the FRP available to, to meet the FRP requirement. Okay? Now when we move to the subsequent FMM run 15 minutes later, what used to be the binding interval becomes now the buffer interval. We still optimize that interval, but we no longer impose the additional need of the FRP requirement. We are saying all, what I need is to meet my energy requirement. Effectively, you procure already FRP for that interval. What you are effectively doing is making it available because the only need that you have is the energy need. You are not imposing an additional need to secure FRP capacity that you may have already procured in the previous interval. So you, you ask for it, you procure for it, and immediately basically release it in the subsequent interval for that buffer interval. But by releasing it, that means the thing you're doing differently is you're not committing a quick start unit. I'm trying to think what would be changed. You might reverse the commitment. You, yeah. you might have said, I need to commit a quick start unit in this period. Yes. I'll wait until then but I, because I, I don't need to start it. But then when you get there, all of a sudden you don't, you don't see that you need it, so you, you don't start it. Is that yes. basically what's... Being, being not not preserved as we're, we're failing to start units that we need to? Because I thought it was that we were consuming flexible units for energy where we should well, have maybe been holding that. Unit, yeah, so it's the same thing. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would be the most extreme case where you really projected to have a unit that was supporting FRP. Now because you no longer enforce that requirement, the market doesn't see the need to have that unit available and doesn't stop the unit. And now, it's too late to do any reprocurement because it's already behind you. When you move into the same time frame for the real-time market, for the RTD market, you are going to be deprived of that capacity because the market never had the opportunity to carry over that capacity or to reprocure it. So in terms of the example there, an example up here, up on top, you might have uh, procured 182 megawatts of FRU 
for that first interval, that's a binding interval, mm -hmm. then when you go to the next time, you, it conceivably you might decommit that in the buffer interval because it now looks like it's no longer needed, or you may simply just reposition units so you don't have as much upward headroom yes. because that, that will be cheaper. Either way, are, those are two different ways you could wind up um, the repositioning the not preserving the because that's done in RQD. Remember, this is, this is all the dispatch is just uh, dreamland. The only thing that, the only objective reality is unit, is unit commitments and interchange schedules. Everything else doesn't matter. Right, that's why I'm trying to get my head around what releasing means. And you're saying the only possible distinction could be if there's a commitment change. Right, and because that that's all. uses up the, the dispatch range or any units because the engine doesn't see you need it. It says, oh, I got all this extra dispatch energy. Why? I don't need to commit that unit because I've, mm -hmm. I don't need to, I got plenty of uh, capacity. So I see why that's a problem for the, for the buffer interval. But when we get, when the buffer interval converts into a binding interval, mm -hmm. doesn't the FRP constraint come back at that point? No, that is already in the past. You are already, in that interval is already behind you because if it is first binding and subsequently it becomes buffer. You see, this is an R, this is an RQD one run, and it's setting the binding, the green one, and it's setting the, it's, it's saying, oh, I need to from, from that green to the next white one. It's saying, I need to have it for that. Mm -hmm. But it's not doing anything for starting this in that first white box, so you've got it during the binding. In other words, this one that is here, the buffer interval, was already the binding in the previous run. So this one is the one that will determine what you needed for this interval or going from this binding interval to this advisory. Any, anything run after this interval is behind you. You cannot reprocure it, you cannot re-optimize it. Here you are going to re-optimize it, but by the fact that you didn't enforce the constraint previously enforced for, uh, in association with that interval, you have basically no opportunity to go back and reprocure for this interval because it's already passed. Any buffer interval becomes, uh, any buffer interval was previously a binding interval, not the other way around. The results are posting at 22 and a half minutes before the green interval starts, right? That's to allow for tagging. Yes. Which, which, so they give, the, the interchange is already fixed for that green interval. The dispatch is going to be what it is, but the, the, the thing that we're almost pointing out is when that, that RTD interval posts, you could be giving instructions for you to start during that first buffer interval so that it's available and BACS allows other units to be dispatched up less so you have more ramp available for the green interval when you get there. So it's really these units that can be started in a, in a relatively quick period of time. Okay, so obviously this poses the question of what we can do. And uh, I think we're going to have this initiative launch and done related to the FRP enhancement. And obviously this has to be one of the items of how we can handle this type of condition moving forward. And obviously this has to touch the formulation of the FRP basically because now we have to determine how we can enforce it or how we can ensure that we carry over the, the requirement over time. <clears throat> Is there any more follow-up, uh, Jim? Okay, the, the second item has to do with the FRP and how we set up the conditions to procure the FRP. Uh, we currently have a construct that is applicable not just to the ISO, but also to each of the EIM areas. It's a real-time construct, and in this case, on one end, we have the determination of the FRP requirement. 
and that is based on the histograms, based on the historical uncertainty that we have in the market. We take the percentile for the the 97.5 percentile for the upward, the 2.5 percentile for the downward. Uh, we take the last 40 days historical data. We build this information to determine what is the FRP requirement for each EIM area, including the ISO. That is what I have characterized as the gross requirement. Now, when we go into the market, this is an FRU, right? FRU, yes. Not this is only FRU. So, when we go into the market, we start with that to be the gross requirement. That is what we need to enforce and apply to each EIM area. As part of the logic that we have for the FRP in the real time market, now we have to take into account the diversity that may happen across the different balancing areas. And basically, what we do is an evaluation of how much transfer capability we can leverage to carry across the different areas potential ramping capacity. That is, if I have one balancing area connected with another balancing area, I may not need to procure internally all my FRP needs because if I have this transfer capability, there may be some uh, flexible ramp capacity that can tra be transferred from the two areas and meet my own requirement. This is what we have called the net import capability, net export capability credit. So if I have these transfer capabilities with other areas, I can effectively use that and have a flexible ramp and transfer from one area to the other. When you take into account the transfer capability that exists from one area to the rest, and you come with a net or effective requirement, in some cases, such as the one that is depicted here, for the CAISO specifically, you can see that the transfer capability that a specific EIM area has may be in excess of the natural requirement. So just to be specific in a case, for instance, for CAISO, if our requirement may be in the range of 1,500 megawatts, and when you go and do the accounting of the transfer capability with all the balancing areas, we may be in the range of 7,000, 8,000 megawatts. What we are saying is that we have 8,000 megawatts of transfer capability that can support my requirement of FRP, and therefore I may not need to explicitly procure internally to my area. Uh, we have seen that this may be too optimistic in some cases, first, because it accounts for the gross transfer capability, that is transmission-based, transfer-based. You may not know if you indeed have 8,000 megawatts of transfer flexibility in other areas that can flow through the transfers. All what you know is that potentially you can flow up to that amount of transfer in terms of ramping. But the other areas may not have that much to support your own needs. So when you go and compare what is the gross requirement versus the effective requirement, what we are enforcing, for instance, for the CAISO, most of the time is a zero requirement. Effectively, what we're saying is that given the transfer capabilities, we don't need to enforce an explicit constraint to procure internally my FRP because we have all this interconnection with other areas and the transfers can be used to, to move the ramping capability. Uh, effectively, what this means is that we may not have an active constraint to impose to meet our own requirements similar to other areas and the only one that becomes effective is the system-wide area. We have a system-wide area in addition to each EIM area. So it is this one, the system-wide, that may determine how much I need to procure, and because it's not locational, it's not zonal, that procurement can be in any proportion applicable to any EIM area. The end result is that if you see naturally what was your FRP requirement for your area versus effectively how much you impose, and how much you actually procure naturally through the system-wide area, you have this delta. And specifically, what I'm meaning is that effectively we want to procure all this much based on the historical uncertainty that we have. Effectively, we impose a requirement of basically zero, and by the natural economics of the market when we procure FRP, some of that capacity was naturally procured within our area and amounts to about the line in red. So potentially, if we have this delta, this is a capacity that potentially may get stranded in other areas and cannot flow into our own area. Uh, we have seen that this may be too optimistic, and we want to reevaluate how we can come with a more reasonable 
uh, bottom line of what the requirement should be for EIM area. Uh, I think there is still a need to evaluate whether there is a specific reformulation to be more conservative on the transfer capability credit, whether we need to impose a specific minimum requirement per area, whether we need to do some bundling of some specific areas given the graphical distribution of the transfers. It's still open to see what the solutions could be. Do we have any questions on the phone? Okay, just to make sure, the, 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 very, the very important point is that the amount of stranded that might not be able to make it into, in this case, the California ISO BA is the difference between the blue and the brown lines. The blue is what California needs, brown is what's required locally, and we hope the, the rest can make it in if it's needed. Yes. So this actually is somehow complementary to the subsequent issue that I described because this is setting up the conditions to get stranded. And if that stranded capacity happens, now you know you may be short by that much. That, without any assumption of how effective, effectively you can deliver the FRP that is internal to your system. Now this is, this is what actually happened when you needed it? Yes. Okay. The, the third topic is related to how, how frequently the FRP can be delivered, how frequently it can get stranded. And there are two levels of complication here. The first one, as I indicated, can be associated with the previous item, how we set up the FRP procurement such that you get allocated or procure FRP in an area that cannot really transfer that to your own area. But the second level could be even within the same area, and we have seen cases specific to California but also to other EIM areas in which the FRP gets stranded not behind a VIM transfer constraint. It gets stranded because internal constraints that is exactly the same effect, and whether it's EIM transfer or internal constraints, the effect may be exactly the same. And, uh, okay, so just to make sure I understand, so on the previous graph, some of that brown stuff that was acquired locally might also get stranded. Yes. Because it's in San Diego and you need it up in the Bay Area. Yes. Uh, we have seen that quite frequently in the CAISO. Given major operating procedure constraints, you can see that the capacity was procured but it's just not deliverable given the, the congestion that exists in the system. And I think this is the, one of the most critical pieces because obviously it talks about how effective the FRP is because at the end of the day, the FRP's capacity that you need to have available to, to tackle the uncertainty that realizes. And if that uncertainty realizes, as typically happens, now that capacity is just not available even though it has been awarded, it has been procured, it's sitting there, but it just, it just cannot be materialized. And uh, again, this is a two level. One portion of the FRP can be stranded behind EIM transfers. Basically, when we impose the EIM transfer constraints and the system-wide uh, requirement, naturally, because of the economics, some FRP capacity may be naturally associated with some constraints, with some EIM areas. So if that capacity now is not uh, available in the, on the transfers, is, is a standard behind the EIM transfers. But the other one is the, the internal constraints. And again, this is another topic that is going to be part of the FRP enhancements, and we will see what options are available. That, that is the next topic that Don is going to cover. Uh, j just to understand where these numbers might come from, is this looking at situations where you have a power balance violation or very high prices and yet you're not dispatching something that was designated FRP. Is that what the brown is? Yes, this is a subset of instances only for uh, checking on the high prices, on high energy prices. That are the most obvious cases. Okay, high energy price but and and designated as FRP but you just didn't use them because because of no local LMPs. Yes. Scott, this is where your 50% number came from, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, just so just to be clear, undelivered on this chart doesn't necessarily mean they were called upon and didn't deliver, it just means that their local prices were quite low. Yes, but let me characterize it a bit more because this is a metric associated only with 
instances where you observe high energy prices. So effectively, you can say that it was actually called on, but could not be delivered. Just because of the fact that you have high prices really means that you are getting tighter and tighter, and therefore, naturally, you would expect the FRP to be released and make and so deployable. In, in, in that instance, are they actually um, are they actually providing FRP, but just in their local area? <laughs> So it's not like they're not doing it, it's just that it's in the wrong place? It, not really. Or, or does the software just sort of say, oh, well, wait, if, if we, don't, we don't actually need flexibility over there, so. It's not deliverable even locally, because what happens is that you have a congestion component on the price that is high enough such that the resource remains deck. And even though you are running tight in your bit of stack of supply and you need more supply, these resources held back for upward movement just because of the congestion. So it's not even locally deployable. It's just sitting there and it's not deliverable at all. Yeah, this is Don. Uh, the market optimization, you know, remember the, in the real time, it's all opportunity cost based in terms of what's setting the price for the flexible ramping up and down. And so it's basically saying, seeing, oh, look at this resource. It's got upward headroom. It can't be dispatched for another megawatt of energy, so there's no real opportunity cost, so I'll put the flexible ramping up capacity there. And this is a very interesting point because we were discussing this. This is not a, I wouldn't say that all the time this is a sequential event in which we request and we procure FRP, and later on we realize that, oh, there is congestion and we couldn't release it. It may happen at the same time that you procure that FRP precisely because of the congestion. So you start with the wrong foot the right, right so away. It's not that like we're using the, the, the stuff we can use and then we turn to the, it's, we actually, this is the first choice stuff because the yeah. opportunity cost <laughs> appears to be zero. Hmm. Yeah, I'd like to add one thing too. Um, one aspect that's also considered this is purely congestion. It's also between EIM areas as a, Everyone mentioned earlier the requirements based upon the EIM, where the net import-export credits all net to zero. So sometimes it's not trapped because of transmission, it's trapped because of transfers. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. Okay, do we have any questions on the phone? No, sorry, you. That's fine. <laughs> Well, let me go to the last topic of FRP for the real time. And that has to do, to some extent, similar logic to what we discussed for the stranded congestion. Uh, we currently have um, basically a, all resources able to provide FRP and be associated with FRP, including the proxy demand response uh, resources. What we realized is that when we were developing this metric of uh, deliverability, we realized that many of the awards were associated with PDRs. By definition, there is no concern with the PDRs being supported for FRP. The challenge that we know because of other analysis we have done is that under the current construct, you may actually issue a five-minute dispatch to a PDR resource based on the economics, based on the conditions of the system. And that could be just one single interval, and for the next interval, that's it. There is nothing else to follow up through. And we know, given the nature of the PDR resources, that they cannot just follow intermittent five-minute interval dispatches. And there is a minimum time, notification time they require to be able to enable their programs. There is a minimum time they need to stay on the program to be able to realize the, the program. And the intermittent nature of the market is based purely on economics. If we are short of capacity, we are going to trigger it. So we know that under these conditions, the PDR resources are not going to be able to follow through for these intermittent resources. Well, it's exactly the same what happens with the, uh, with the FRP. It may happen that given the prices that we observe for PDRs, they may be naturally positioned to get awarded FRP because typically they may be sitting in the, in the high range of the prices, and therefore, under normal conditions, they are not going to be dispatched for energy. That makes the market to think that, well, these are the best resources to procure for FRP because there is no opportunity cost between energy and FRP, so it gets awarded FRP. 
Now when we instruct them to, to follow a, a family instruction, they are not going to follow through naturally because they are unable to do so. So we have, we have worked that FRP and we know that it's not going to be deployable. In that case, I think there is a short term and a longer term solution. The short term solution is that we are evaluating if we can basically not allow these resources to get FRP until we go with a longer term solution. And that longer term solution is something that we already tackled. And that was part of what we call the SDR phase three. And basically what we want to give them is a modeling opportunity, how they can bid into the market and treat them similarly to the 15 minute resources. That means if you clear them through the FMN market, they will have a notification time similar to the interties and they will have to stay at a minimum number of intervals online similarly to the, to the interties. That would be a much closer approach to their reality, and therefore at that time we can really see which ones can really deliver or not that, that service, and at that time they will be able to, to get back to the procurement of the FRP. <laughs> Okay, that's what I have for FRP. Uh, as I indicated earlier, one of the other concerns that we have related to the analysis need was to analyze the, the performance of the interties. And obviously that touches the part of the intertie pricing. Uh, we did a very lengthy analysis of the intertie performance related to prices specifically, and we analyzed specific cases, some of those as pointed in the MSC opinion, to try to understand what were the drivers to this uh, price divergence between typically HASP and the 15-minute market. And uh, I think one of the main it uh, items has to do with the inherent nature and timing of our market. We have the HAS market run first for hourly resources and in which we produce advisory for the 15-minute resources. Then we come with the 15-minute market run and we come with the final financially binding prices that are used not just for the 15-minute resources but also for the previously awarded hourly resources. So the fact that we have these hourly awards settled on the 15-minute prices and if there are differences happening between these two markets. Potentially, we may have an inconsistency between the dispatches and the prices. Uh, I think this has to do really with the basic and inherent nature of the sequencing of our markets. And remember, this is an incremental settlement, so we settle on the differences of, of these markets. And instead of trying to change or adjust the timing and the sequencing of the markets, we really want to go after the specific instances that may create the divergence across these markets. And the following items that we have is really going into that area. What we can do to eliminate these systematic uh, conditions that may create price divergence between the HASP and the 15-minute market and the 5-minute market. Uh, one of those has to do with specific uh, conditions that we have to account for in the market, and one of them is, for instance, the losses that we have to take into account when we have a schedules in one of the, our uh, high voltage DC lines. And specifically, this is the line of the PDCI in which we have to account for the losses that may flow over. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that we know what the losses are going to be once we know what the schedules are. So if we want to account for the losses prior to knowing what the schedules are, we have to come with some estimate. Uh, that is the reason that currently we don't have that consideration in the HASP market because the HASP market is the one that is going to determine what the flows are going to be. Once we know what the flows are going to be, there is this estimation of what the losses are going to be, and those losses can be put into the corresponding FMM and RTD markets. What this causes is a divergence, a discrepancy between the HASP and the FMM and RTD markets because FMM and RTD are going to account for these specific losses in kind, in megawatts, but HASP doesn't have that information yet. So the variation of losses that may happen is going to create this persistent difference of uh, megawatts between the HASP and FMM. In some cases specifically, because this is modeled on one specific intertie, 
it may actually create a congestion divergence because you may have more megawatts in one market than in the other. Uh, what we are evaluating is how we can come with a good estimate of what the losses are going to be in the FMM and RTD markets to take that estimate and model that in the corresponding hash market to close the gap between these two markets. And that should align better the megawatts and also the potential congestion that may exist on this intertype. And as you can see in the, in the report that we put together, is the, the most dominant divergence that you can see in the intertype is really on this constraint. So I just have a very basic question. Uh, a couple, what, two, three years ago, um, uh, the full network model was implemented. <clears throat> is the full network model used in HASP as well as FMM and so forth? And wouldn't it automatically calculate the losses? I'm not. Uh, what am I missing here? Is there something about the treatment of the DC yes, circuit there, in particular that yes. FNM does not? calculate the losses on that? Is the full a, network models. Yeah. Is the specific losses that flow on the constraint what we don't have? Currently, basically, right now is zero as per the model. Uh, a couple of years ago, we implemented a pricing enhancement on the high voltage and DC elements. And we are exploring if we can leverage on that formulation to systematically model and account to some extent for the losses through the market rather than having this specific in-kind accounting of the losses. Because right now it's a megawatt value. It's not that we determine optimally what the losses should be. It's just that in-kind we take a certain megawatt of losses and we put it as fixed in, in, in the constraint. So this is a, if, if I understand, this is a shortcoming of the modeling of the physical system, a a model with full fidelity, full network model with full fidelity would endogenously calculate what the losses would be on the DC circuits as it does on the AC system. Yes. And so this is <clears throat> this is not a problem with anything coming in over the AC inner ties. We at least approximate that with a full network model. But for the DC inner tie, it's a problem because the losses are not captured in the FNM. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and again, with and, and it's not just a tweak to the model. It's, it's a formulation that could account for explicitly the losses accounting on the constraint. And again, with the enhancement that we did two years ago or so for the pricing, we opened the door for that formulation. So we may be able to leverage on that formulation to optimally determine the losses in the market. But that is still subject to, to evaluation. Okay. But to make a slight digression, I mean, the, the full network model could faithfully represent all the electrical transmission aspects, but we're still just ballparking the actual injections outside of uh, the KISO visibility, right? So, <laughs> and this is an interesting point because the scales that flown that intertie only a portion of those are kinds of flows. So that, that is the other level of complexity that we have. Okay, let me move on to the next one. There is another item that we identified that potentially created divergence on specific constraints. And that has to do with the fact that in some cases you may observe congestion on one market and then that congestion disappears in the subsequent market or the other way around. And we have, to a less extent, but still continue to happen, the fact that we have per requirements what we call the transmission rights reservation. There are participants that hold this transmission rights and they can basically use it or release it up to a certain point on time. In terms of the time frame, those rights, if they are not being used, we still have to hold them in the HASP run. When we move subsequently to the FMM and RTD, basically they are released. So effectively, this creates a scenario in which we may have uh, holding some capacity available in HASP that later on is made available to the FMM and RTD. And if you basically have to clear the market in FMM with more capacity, most likely you are not going to observe congestion in the FMM market when this condition occurs. And for some specific cases that we analyzed, some of those pointed out by the MSC.
price divergence. This happened to be a factor to that and divergence between the HASP and the 15-minute market. Uh, the natural question is, can we do something else to what we are currently doing? By requiring we still have to honor those rights, what we are trying to see is if there is a, any better way to release the capacity in HASP, and then if that capacity is called upon later, that maybe we have to accommodate that and prorata the capacity that may have been already allocated. But as of now, basically it's just the, the interplay that happens between the two markets. Yeah. Another minute. I noticed in uh, your discussion of a number of these hours that uh, you talked about this, the, uh, the tie was congested in Hass, there was significant congestion, and then of course Hass didn't schedule, we cut back the schedules to where there was no congestion, and then we had no congestion in FMM. So that though you might have had a significant congestion component in Hass, but then it goes to zero. And that implies to me that there were no 15-minute schedules, because if there were 15-minute schedules, they would have seen the congestion. But I'm wondering, is that sort of a felt self-fulfilling prophecy that people don't want to put in 15-minute schedules when they know there's going to be congestion, so they just put in hourly schedules, bid low, knowing that then they're not going to have to pay anything, and they, everybody has the incentive to get the high price if the congestion disappears. Uh, so. It'd be uh, kind of inter you know maybe we should be thinking about if if that's the pattern of people we see the people deliberately seeming to submit all hourly schedules during these periods maybe we ought to have a rule about a different pricing rule when there's only hourly schedules on time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a very interesting area. I, I haven't seen that from that perspective. Uh, what I was looking is in another more basic case in which effectively there are no 15-minute resources. Mm -hmm. And what typically may happen is that you may have excess of bids in one intertie, and effectively the market has to economically find the clearing point, and therefore it creates congestion in HASP. Imagine you don't have any 15-minute resources, only hourly resources. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there is congestion in HASP. Now, when we go to FMM, everything is fixed. Mm -hmm. There is nothing to optimize, nothing to move around to generate a price signal. Basically, now the price signal vanishes because HASP already took care of the congestion. So and I remember when we implemented the first 764, that was the philosophical debate. What is the right price signal for congestion in this case? Uh, should it be basically gone in the FMM market because really there is nobody else willing to, to move to, to generate that price signal? Everything is set based on the hourly resources, but that creates this divergence between the two markets. Congestion in HASP, that is resolved in HASP, FMM is free, no congestion, nobody else moves. Uh, to the counterpoint, in that specific case, there wouldn't be any incremental settlement because nobody else got something different than what they clearly have. But right, but the thing is, it'll be there'll be there'll be no congestion on the tie, so they'll yeah. get the full LMP. LMP. Whereas yeah. if they had, we had some 15-minute bids that reflected the congestion, and you know it's five years later, I think we'd all hope that the 15-minute Bids would be there, and now we, you know, if we see them that there's a, they're, they're not, maybe we need to, to think about uh, this isn't a temporary phenomenon after anymore after five years, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, Scott. I, I know we moved past it, but I, I, perhaps I missed, but the, the previous slide, slide 14, was there. Um, uh, recommendation, okay, um, that's not one. Um, okay, uh, sorry, slide 15. Uh, okay, uh, this can lead. So right now there's not a solution being discussed aside from more speculative discussion we've just had of how we might approach this. Yeah. Uh, this problem recognized the, the ISO may be losing congestion revenue, but it's not affecting the efficiency of the scheduling. But but we're, the ISO is, in the end, the consumers are going to have to come up with more money as a result of this. Yeah, we are not married right now to a solution of a change, I would say. Yeah. It's something that we're still exploring. Okay. 
because part of the requirements that we have to honor those transmission rights, so we have to hold that capacity one way or the other, or make sure that that capacity is available for the holders of, of the rights. Okay, thanks, Guillermo. And the last one, that was also an item that we found through the analysis that we did when we were analyzing the convergence of VR resources from the day ahead market to the real time market. And what we currently have is that we cleared the IFM based on bids submitted by participants, inclusive of the VR resources. Now, because there is this ability, flexibility of resources to bid in up to their capa maximum capacity in the IFM, there is no guarantee that what they bid in and what they clear is going to match the forecasted value for production. When we go from the financial market to the reliability market, to the rock market, we want to make sure that we don't overcommit resources by not accounting fully for the potential production of renewable resources. What we currently have is a process in which for any resource that participated in any way, either with surface scales or economical bits in the integrated forward market, and it's a VR resource, what we do is a true up process. If they underbid in the IFM market their forecasted capacity, we throw up that up to their forecast such that when we clear the RAC process, we account fully for that forecasted capacity. And the intention of this is to ensure that we account for all the potential forecasted production of VR resources so that we don't have to overcommit resources in RAC. The the limitation that we currently have is that this is applicable only to resources that effectively participated in the integrated forward market. If there is a resource that didn't submit a bid or a surface scale at all in the IFM, we don't do this through up. Basically, just ignore that resource because we don't have a mechanism to throw up that, that specific bid. What we want to do right now is expand that logic to basically all applicable VR resources, regardless whether they have a bit or not. Uh, and again, this is only for the rock process, for the reliability process. This is not for the integrated forward market, which is the financial market. And this is really to try to close a bit more the gap between what they may be bidding versus what actually may be show up in the, in the real time market eventually. And the and the expectation is that we can minimize the amount of overcommitment that we may have by not accounting fully for the VR production projected in the day ahead market. Okay. Is this a handful of megawatts? Is it sometimes many dozens or even 100 megawatts? Or it ranges in the few hundred megawatts. Oh. And I okay. Think I think uh, so. Thank you, Guillermo. Uh, that's, uh, let's see if there are any comments or questions from the committee or within the room. I guess we can check on the phone line. <coughs> okay, great. Well, I pre appreciate the summary and definitely appreciate all the incredible hard work. Who else, what, what, who are the other members of the team that put together this report? Oh, Which I have to congratulate you team. on. Yeah, I, I have Robert Hill with me in the room. Thank you. We work very hard in the FRP, actually, in the four items that we described. And I have other five, six members of the team that contributed heavily to the report. Yeah. Okay. It's an important and well done report. Thank you. Uh, congratulations. And just to circle back to the origin, so the, you know, the MSC opinion you, you referred to, the, the issue was largely around the, the uh, I guess, the perception at the time that there was, at the same time there was a lot of undelivered imports, uh, there was a lot of exceptional dispatch going on as well, and the sense or, or the, the question about whether those two were the same resources or not, but then in the end after the data were sort of finalized, it turns out that there wasn't a lot of exceptional dispatch overlapping with those uh, those. Uh, undelivered inner tie hours. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, um, it's a nice segue into the Don's presentation on uh, FRP. There have been a, a lot of recent developments in terms of what's been learned about uh, FRP performance recently, and so I was trying to figure out what to do. Exactly. So based on Guillermo's wonderful report, we'll be kicking off uh, uh, 
geared to an initiative to try to improve upon the flexible ramping product and addressing those issues uh, that Guillermo highlighted. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about, and I made sort of a comment to, that made this before, but when we talk about, think about deliverability, um, it's really not awarding the flexible ramping product to resources that have a zero opportunity cost because of congestion. You know, it's the same thing even from an energy standpoint. If you think about the advisory interval, well, yes, in one run it could be feasible that that's a feasible energy schedule in the advisory interval, but things change and then it's no longer feasible. But this is an issue where in, based on the current best information you have now, you actually put it and know it that it isn't going to be there when you run the next uh, market run. And so the first one is the flexible ramping up resource when it's behind the constraint. So it sees that there's, uh, there's headroom on that resource, that there's not an opportunity cost for the energy because it can't be dispatched for more, but I'll put my flexible ramping up awards there. And when we go to the next market run, since it's already constrained, we know we can't dispatch and get that incremental, it basically convert that flexible ramping up into energy. The similar occurrence uh, occurs on uh, the flexible ramping down when it's providing counterflow to resolve congestion. So in this case, the, the resource is dispatched at a high level. The market sees that it can't be dispatched lower, so there's no opportunity co cost of dispatching it out of merit and it puts the down award on that resource. But when we go to the next market run and try to call on the flexible ramping down, we can't actually decrease the output of the resource because now we would create congestion. So this issue is on, on both of the products in terms of, 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 uh, of the making sure that you don't award to resources that you know now you can't call on in the next run. It's less about various scenarios and things that can change. Uh, you know, that's always going to be there, and you could, you could try to address that, but I think at a minimum, this is what we want to try to address as from, the, from the deliverability uh, enhancement standpoint. Ben. Yeah. So, uh, Don, just referring back to um, Guillermo's presentation last time he had, I forget was what color they were, the brown resources that couldn't be delivered, um, which were often pretty large. Um, um, I, I, let's see, that's, I guess that's FRU, so that would be the, yeah. and some of those get bottled up because of internal uh, BA constraints, and sometimes they get bottled up because of constraints between BAs. So do we know, uh, just be curious, a breakdown of, and I'm sorry, I can only wave the thing, uh, 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 the responsibility for bottling those up, uh, to what extent was internal constraints versus between BA? Oh. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Um, yeah, uh, proportions of it are, as I mentioned earlier, behind EIM constraints, um, and some of them are also within ISO internal constraints. So um, I can get those numbers, but I don't have them right now. Okay, thank you. Okay. So in terms of uh, the new initiative that we're kicking off, so again, we're targeting a, 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 have a relatively quick initiative where we can identify changes that we can put in place as part of the fall 2020 implementation. So that's where we're going to try to, uh, we'll go out with an issue paper straw proposal in the November timeframe and then try to make it to the March board for a decision on the changes we're looking to make. Um, Guillermo talked about uh, many of these, the, the buffer interval, uh, whether we want to maintain a requirement in that so that you don't uh, release it all and not have it available for the real-time dispatch, um, looking on, at the PDRs. And then there's three areas really around the more granular procurement. So if you think about what we do today with regards to the balancing authority area level requirements, you know, can we put in a minimum requirement so that we don't uh, set everybody's requirement to zero and, and use that as a way to distribute it around the system to address anything that's bottled up behind an EIM transfer constraint. Um, then the next area where we uh, have already talked a little about, about in the day ahead market enhancements was whether we wanted to implement sub-regional zones within the balancing areas to then further distribute it, not just among the balancing authority areas, but the balancing authority area's requirement within its balancing authority area. So that's what we were calling the zonal approach. 
And then lastly, we're also looking at whether it's technically feasible to, to go nodal, where we basically develop a, a, a deployment scenario where we assume that the flexible ramping up plus the energy is transmission feasible and the, flex, the energy minus the flexible ramping down uh, awards are feasible. And so in the next couple, next two slides, I was trying to highlight and figured we could have a discussion about the benefits of, of zonal relative to nodal. So uh, before we go on to that, so yeah. the first point, that would be just as, as simple as just retaining the demand curve that you now have in the, in the binding interval and advisory. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, so not, not some well, other different approach. No, I think, well, I think the key thing in the first, the first bullet here, I think it's determining how much of it you actually retain because, again, some of the uh, flexible ramping product is it actually covering FMM to FMM market run intervals, and so you'd want to release that, but then there's also a portion that's covering FMM to RTD uncertainty, and you wouldn't want to release that one, per se. But you'd be willing to release, if it's costly enough, you'd be willing to release it. That, and so we're using a demand curve rather than a hard constraint. Right. Okay, so next I tried to put down a, a first pass and I'd be very interested in your opinions in terms of the pros and the cons of the zonal versus the nodal approach. Uh, so with regards to the, the zonal, uh, it is a more uh, less uh, complex implementation and, and strain on computational resources and it's very consistent with what we do with our uh, existing approach for ancillary services. Um, where we don't ensure that the ancillary services are deliverable but on a day-ahead time frame, you know, we've tried to procure 100% of it, then operations does a series of studies, and since we don't re-optimize it in real time, they can then identify areas where it's potentially not deliverable and then go re-procure and buy more incremental amounts uh, in real time. But they're not doing like a, we're not doing like a full re-optimization. Um, but the flexible ramping product, you know, we are constantly going to be wanting to re-optimize that in real time. So. Um, uh, it's a little more complex than the way we do the ancillary services. So. Um, making sure I understand. So, for example, uh, con uh, contingency reserve spin, you're saying that the, the operators do look at that, but they don't need to look at it very frequently during the day, but you're saying with FRP because it's changing. A, the resources that are providing that may change a lot. Every five-minute interval. Minute interval it could. Okay. So that may, that may mean a different approach then. Yeah. Well, but if we... <laughs> If we study where this non-deliverable FRU is, there may be simple things like they're establishing no-fly zones, and we don't put it in that pocket because it's always bottled, and it's really easy to just say no FRP there. No FRU. Exactly, which is, you, which is you got to the third bullet on my contour. You need to actually develop that, and, they, and they, they, the operators have those that logic and those tools where they'll block and say don't buy any ancillary services in this area because I know it can't right, get but out. But if we, if we, if they're in that also, so we can see where the, you know, where are the bad areas. We can build it into the software yep. so the operators have to don't do it. But the, you know, RTPD knows don't count yep. flexible ramp right. in so that I think, pocket. I'm with you. So I think what you develop on this is zones, and then you'd need to determine how you sh spread the system requirement amongst those zones, which will lead to the needs for minimum and maximum requirements for potentially for those zones, and then developing the logic to block certain areas when you don't want anything coming up. So, well, I could see that being a kind of practical, easy, well, practical and uh, is subject, uh, subjective, I guess, but so it seems like you might risk getting into sort of, we just don't want their flexible ramp, that, that uh, it seems like you need some kind of objective rule at least to pass us some kind of non-discriminatory test. <laughs> so I don't know how, how arbitrary or how you, even if you kind of know the, the stuff is coming from a specific place, I'm not sure you can just sort of ban that place's flexible right. ramp without a more sort of generic rule. And then again, I they, don't know how for uh, And then to the extent that. within those zones, there's still congestion within that zone, you'll run into the same problem that I highlighted on my first slide where the market optimization is going to pick it there. So, I, Yeah, I guess I was thinking more in terms of just kind of um, trying to come up with a technology or, or um, firm Some agnostic, way yeah, agnostic rule as opposed to just sort of saying we don't want their yeah. flexible ramp, right. which might seem discriminatory. So this, this is reminiscent of the minimum online constraint uh, issue and that um, 
the operators, I guess, were accustomed to, to, to meeting that by acquiring certain resources, whether it was just easy or seemingly obvious. And then when you did CME, it turned out that that was a lot more efficient way to do it when you consider the whole network that in order to meet the need. And so similarly here, if you do some zones and um, that seemingly intuitive zones or whatever, it could be that if you did the um, uh, network instead, you might uh, procure it uh, much more differently and more cheaply, but you don't know until you test. Okay. Yep. So any other comments on the, the zonal approach that anyone want to? Well, I guess do we, it's sort of a follow-on to the earlier question, um, do we know that a lot of this stuff is coming from a specific place that, like, uh, That's why I'm a practical empirical question. Yeah. We ought to just know how much of this is simple and stupid as opposed to complicated before we, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there's one part of it that's really complicated and one part that's really simple and stupid, and that should guide us. Hi, this is Robert Fish with California. So, um, Mark Validation. Uh, so, the breakdown in comparison on the report that we, you saw, we we know from the EIM area which components aren't coming from. We know uh, why that's occurring, and uh, hence the discussion of the zonal requirements and also behind. Um, so we know that would help the deliverability. In regards to the congestion, um, uh, local congestions within areas, uh, we're, we're starting to do a deeper dive into those aspects. That's actually my plan next week. Yeah, because we'd even need that information even to define the zones as well, too. Okay. So, uh, Don, if I could just ask a very general question that if there's any experience we can learn with based on uh, zonal acquisition of uh, ancillary services. So it, um, spin, non-spin all have the same problem in that uh, the market software is going to try to find the stuff that has the lowest opportunity cost, and that's probably the stuff that's bottled up behind congestion, and that's not useful for energy either. Um, when the operators do their, as you mentioned, they do their studies during the day and then, and, 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 and then tweak things, do they wind up having to move um, uh, change the uh, procurement a lot because, you know, very frequent, frequently they find the, uh, the spin or non-spin are behind constraints and they can't get access to it, or is it just, uh, do they wind up just making small changes typically? You know, um, how, how well have the zones worked for ancillary services uh, and, and, and uh, lowered the amount of work that the operators have to do? I, I think they work relatively well. Um, but they are spending time always focusing, making sure that they've, they've got it. It's not something where they, we can set the zones and then not worry about it for the next two weeks. Okay, no. so it's enough work that you wouldn't want to put people in the position of having to do this for FRP, which is moving around a lot, right. a lot more. Yeah, okay. and I guess I would, I would expect that maybe for, I haven't looked at the stats on this, but that for spin and non-spin, you're, the, it's being deployed contingency-based, and so there's going to be less observations of when the deliverability problem comes up. And there's probably exceptional dispatch being deployed in cases where they're really worried about it being in the wrong places that they probably aren't doing okay. for an FRP. Problems might not show up yeah. as often. Yeah, Paul. Uh, Paul Gribick, pg and &E. uh, I just wanted to make one comment on this. Uh, a while back, anticipating this kind of stuff coming along, I looked around and said, okay, who has a, a model where deploying ancillary services and reserving transmission and allowing the deployed AS to compete for transmission directly with energy in their market? And basically, MISO has one of those. And I asked them how they were, they, they developed that, but they also kept their minimum zonal procurement requirement in place. So they were belt and suspenders, as usual. And they told me that they were running into problems where their minimum zonal procurement was causing price spikes. They were basically saying, I've got to have this much in this area and it must be in this area, and price spike. And they looked around and said, oh, my God, the transmission was open. We could have used it. So I'm a little concerned about that here. 
But on the flip side, I'm also very concerned about expanding your market model to model all that interaction. That's basically taking your generator uh, contingency RAS type transmission constraints and making another class of those. And sooner or later, your, your market's going to crash because you can't solve it. So I'm not sure what the answer is, but uh, I would be very careful with this, that just relying on zonal, you could end up causing uh, pricing anomalies. That's yep. just my and that was, sense. And did those pricing anomalies spill over into the energy because oh, yeah. it's co-optimized? Okay. That's what they told me that was spilling over. I don't have all their data. But I did reach out So I know you guys got this. How's it work? Yeah, and we have been talking to MISO about how they're doing deployment scenarios for, it's really just for the regulation, where then they, they know that they can sync it to a load center, then they don't have to model, for instance, a scenario where, like, the largest generator went out. Like that, that they haven't implemented, but they've thought about how you would do that and how it's actually, different. Actually, they do have it for spin and on spin as well. Yeah, they do. It yep. just doesn't work very well. Right. Yeah. Well, they, they, they were talking about going to nodal which is what they would have to do to get it to work better. They tried to do some bastard combination of nodal and zonal. And that's a, so either you go one and go whole hog on it and bite the bullet, or you stick with the other, I would say. It's Mike. Mike. You know, that we could uh, think about is, we, you know, you're going to yell at me, I know, because they're the optimization issues, but you know, we do have the congestion component, and you could say, are these locations constrained down to a hub? You know, choose a hub like Palo Verde. Is it constrained down to Palo Verde? If it's constrained down to Palo Verde, then it's, it's model, right? And you wouldn't need to run the whole, a whole other model. All you need to do is know that it's constrained down to Palo Verde, but unfortunately that's part of the solution to the model, and we want to have that to the input to the solution. You know, well, and you got a single resource could be providing counterflow and... Well, if it's constrained <laughs> down, that's for the constrained down. So if it was constrained down, then, and not constrained down the relative to Palo Verde, then it can't be dispatched, you know, up. Now, then yeah. you could turn it around and look at it the other way for, for stuff providing ramp down and say, is it constrained up relative to Palo Verde? And if it is, then we can't, uh, we can't ramp it down, or there's some cost to doing it. Uh, but again, that's the, the problem is that you need, you need to know the answer before you can, so that, you know, that's to do, I, I already know that's to do a whole another level of, uh, op, of complicated solutions. Uh, but that's why I kind of like to know what the, the nature of the problem is a little bit, because maybe if it's stable enough, we could use last intervals, you know, five minutes, the congestion growth from five minutes ago to, uh, set the uh, the ramp for the next five minutes. You know, if it's not changing that much, maybe that's stable enough. Well, maybe this is the same thing, but I was wondering if you could ex exclude or use the, when you're determining opportunity cost, exclude the transmission component so that if, <laughs> so, so that if you are getting a, a zero opportunity cost because of the transmission, yeah. That it can't do that within a, a mixed integer linear program. The fine balance that's uh, can't have dual and primal variables and at the same time. That's the problem. I mean, you might be able to do something iterative and ad hoc, but Paul's smiling. I'm just afraid of how that's going to work. Uh, I think there's all sorts of unintended consequences. I would be very afraid of that. I'm, I don't know if anyone's smart enough to implement that. Uh, as a, a, a heuristic that won't have glitches. Yeah, I guess uh, something like Scott's suggestion that yeah. using, use, yeah, using the using the last ones and using that as a pit penalty or a bonus for FRP for the next one. Um, you could get some interesting dynamics there, perhaps. But Okay. Are there any questions in the room or on the phone or comments on the zonal approach before I move to nodal? Um, okay. So if we go to the full nodal uh, approach, so it does address the wording, the FRP inconsistent with the congestion and prices that flexibility more accurately. Um, and it really is, in my mind, the, the longer term solution to address the operational concerns. And I think even if we look at how the market's progressing, that if you have lots of zero marginal cost resources, the real 
it's really going to be the marginal cost of this uncertain capacity that holding the uncertainty that's really going to be the, the where the revenue comes from. Um, and so having locational capacity prices as well as locational energy prices are probably going to become more meaningful over time. Uh, with regards to the cons, um, there's a very high implementation cost and effort uh, to put something like that in place. Um, it doesn't guarantee the deliverability, just guarantees that we don't do the, the stupid thing in terms of knowingly award it, um, because we all know that system conditions are going to change, but at least you've addressed the, the, the minimum requirement. And then as we thought about trying to port this over to the imbalance reserves in the day ahead market time frame, may need to have discussions around do you need to have CRRs for capacity because now they'll have a congestion component uh, within them. Similar to what we saw with issues, what, a year ago was it with CME? When were, when were we talking about contingency CRRs? For? That was, yeah, that was part of the CME okay. probably three years ago. So, uh, okay, so thinking back to why were we willing to go ahead with CME, which would presumably have the same objections? Is that because it's clear what the scenario is? There are only a few contingencies? And in all honesty, I don't recall the logic on that. I mean, all these same object pros and cons apply to that, but somehow CME, it just weren't very many cases I think to worry about. I think we, we're, we're only going to enforce it for a few constraints, yeah. maybe. It's also a well-defined contingency because it's a transmission contingency as opposed to that, this is where is the variability of intermittent resource output. One day it could be the sun going behind a cloud in Seattle. Another time it could be, yep. you know, something happened in, you know, San Diego or, or L.A. or whatever. Uh, but that's why I think it's a little bit different from the traditional contingency where you're looking, you can actually model the, the largest generator going out and can you dispatch it or the, the transmission line going down. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's a matter of, of degree and not kind in the sense that uh, the CME, it's, that's using the network constraints and its contingency. They're just, it's the it's same thing qualitatively, but quantitatively there's just a lot more possibilities you, we might have to consider if we try to do the same approach for uh, FRP. Yeah, so if you went nodal, would the demand be also nodal in the sense? Uh, so if you think about the variation that's happening node by node and... Well, that's what you know, Paul was saying, the regulation yeah. model spreads it out where the load is. Mm -hmm. It might be a good assumption for regulation, but it might not be a great assumption for FRP. You know, it's, uh, or, or you assume, or it might not even be a good assumption for load. Yeah, I think that, like uh, for their spending reserve, I think that they define the mess of zones and say, in this zone, my largest contingency right. would be such side, and they spread that out over the nodes in the zone. So again, it's still and not perfect. Yeah, and regulation they're doing two of the load centers. Uh, and so I think we would have to think that through and say we would distribute it to the to the load as well as maybe identify where various variable energy resources are. So we're distributing it to the net load in that that area. Yeah, just okay. Eric Little from Edison. Um, just real quick, Don. I believe we haven't implemented CME, right? That's uh, correct. Okay, so the board approved it. We didn't go through with it. So before we would figure out whether or not. This is adaptable to that. Maybe we ought to figure out why we didn't do the other. <laughs> I, I guess I'm just a little, one of the things I would want to look at is sort of a meta optimization. It can be built, and you can define it, you can define all sorts of different scenarios you want to build into it. The question is, how much is that going to take in terms of computational resources? How much are you preventing yourself from implementing something that may come further down the line, which would be vastly more important. I'd be very careful of uh, just going whole hog on this. You know, it's, it's fun. I'd be, you know, I'd like working on it, but on the flip side, I would just say be very careful. Yeah, that goes back to Scott's advice about let's, and what we were talking about before, let's take a, a deep dive and really understand what the nature are the constraints that are causing the problems. It might be something, might be something simple with a simpler solution. Well, if Don, that was your last, my last slide, right? slide. Yeah. So, I mean, to pick up on that, I've been mulling over what sort of the implications of where we are now are. Because if we thought about 
as my understanding, sir, we, we wanted to have FRP to both have the system optimization better uh, deal with the consequences of more variability and unpredictability, but also we, at various times, you know, linked it to like flexible capacity and, and trying to have short-term markets better reflect value for flexible resources. And it seems like the style aspects are that at least when when we have high price events, the FRP price is zero almost all the time. And uh, part of the or part of the maybe reason for that is because of the we're acquiring it in the wrong places. Uh, and so what, you know, what are the implications of that or who's, who's losing um, because of this? And, and in other words, do we, and there's a bunch of ways. So there's probably maybe local flexible resources who should have been selected for FRP who are not. Yep. Um, what do we think about their revenue implications? Um, what do we think the, or I guess I'm not sure what your intuition is on whether the energy price would have been lower or higher if this were, you know, behaving in a way that we originally thought it should behave? Um, or would things look more or less the same in that sense? Or, you know, what would be, what would be different if this were working in a way that, uh, that we, that was more consistent with what we thought it should be? So, so when, I, when I think back on the flexible rent product, it was really trying to address two issues. If you recall, we had a price formation issue because we do a multi-interval real-time optimization where when we were holding somebody out of merit in the binding interval, that opportunity cost was showing up in the advisory interval. And then the subsequent market run, it had no, op no awareness that, that that opportunity cost had occurred. And so that basically was penalizing our flexible resources. I think we've actually addressed that because, you know, we have the forecasted movement settlement, and when that occurs within the forecast, you're going to have a non-zero price for the flexible ramping product. I think where it's not providing us what we wanted was having additional ramp capability to cover the uncertainty, where we would have the expectation that uh, most is going to raise the energy prices a little all of the time so that we don't have super high prices a few of the times but it should have brought both up. But if we're constantly clearing at zero for the flexible ramping product, it's not doing that. We're not clearing it where we need. So if you think about the problems we have, the operators see that they have no actual flexible ramp. What can you do to get more flexible ramp? Well, you schedule more, if we modeled it right, you'd schedule more imports to back down units that actually can be, could be ramped up. And that's what they do in an ad hoc basis. So if we, we're modeling it right. We and the, economically schedule some of those imports. We might economically commit more units instead of the operators having to goose them on. With they're also forms. exceptionally dispatching their right. slower resources all the way up so that they back down the faster resources so they're there to ramp, where if you had the flexible ramping product working, it would hold all the headroom on the fast one because that's the one that can get it. And it would dispatch up some of the, the, slower. Some of the units that had extra ramp up so you could back down the units that were close to their, their upper limit, and that would tend to raise the energy price. Right. So it, you know, it's potentially related to a lot of the things we've been dealing with over the past two years. Ryan. Hey, this is Ryan Kerlinski from DNM. I mean, but so the, the issue you're talking about in terms of, you know, ramping up some of the, the uh, slower ones and, and getting, the, getting, the, uh, getting some maybe some ramping up the inner ties, that won't be solved just by, by dealing with the locational aspect. I think we've been recommending for years now, and, and we continue to recommend maybe in this initiative to you guys take into consideration extending, you know, looking at uncertainty beyond just five-minute uncertainty. So procuring ramp through a product that looks at uncertainty, say, an hour out or two hours out, as opposed to just uncertainty five minutes out. And, and, and then that, that might actually help address some of these issues you guys, that you guys just raised. I think it does look at uh, – we, we, we try to maintain ramp all the way out to the – the horizon, and there's a penalty price for not having it all the intervals. It's only most meaningful up near term, but we we are presumably making commitment decisions and other forward decisions based on maintaining it out over the entire RTD horizon. But the uncertainty component is still only that 15 minute, right. five I mean, minute. It's, it's not two hours worth of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So the other extreme would be DAME, right, which is we consider 24 hours, which is much huger. And then, well, know, I, think, I think we've, all, we've always talked about this that uh, 
you know, not all of your uncertainty materializes in one five-minute interval. And some of it can materialize, you know, for five hours of the day and you saw it coming and you don't really need five-minute dispatchable to do that. But I think the way I look at this is I'd like to get the five-minute dispatchable working and then look at seeing if we can, if we need additional products beyond that with different ramp considerations. But it sounds like your your intuition is, which I think was mine, um, maybe I'm just piggybacking, uh, that in essence, if it were working, we should see higher prices during periods where we're expecting the uncertainty because we might be doing some modest reallocation, but then probably lower prices during some of the, the peaks where we're sort of scrambling. But, well, or yeah, we we wouldn't have that scarcity because we would have already had ramping capability, at least ones in which ramp constraints are setting those yes. prices. Yeah, um, and although with the qualification that when exceptional dispatch and and load conformance and things are in play, it's, it's hard to know what's going what's happening with prices. Um, it depends on sort of how accurate some of those those things are. But unfortunately, if they're exceptionally dispatching because they don't believe the flexible ramping products holding them holding ramp capability for them, you know, if we solve that where it's actually holding ramp capability, we can drive down the needs for the need for those out of market actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And see, if, we were, if we were doing the optimization right, when we actually had a price spike and we had a power balance violation, we should see a high price of the, the ramp because we should have used up every we should have used everything up and gone short on ramp because we needed it now. And when we see this thing where the price is still zero when we have a power balance violation because it's we got all our flexible ramp where it can't be used, you know. So I have a, a general question. I think this is probably for Paul as much as anybody. Okay, 10, 20, 30 years in the future, we've got a lot more computational capabilities. Some people have, uh, have said they'll be in the future, we will no longer have you know, fixed megawatt requirements for reserves and, and, and zones, but in fact should consider lots of contingencies for energy and just, and just let a stochastic program figure out where to put it and how much and so forth. Um, there are others who said that vision is fundamentally flawed because um, this blow, that path blows up exponentially and it will always outrun any computer capabilities you have. We'll always need to define reserve requirements and, and do things like that. And I'm wondering, Paul, since you have a lot of experience thinking about these sorts of things, whether you have an opinion on that or not, but if we're sitting here 20 years from now, God forbid, uh, talk about this. You, you just gave the answer. 20 years from now, I'm going to be retired. I won't <laughs> care. <laughs> but you also said this is fun. Yeah, that's uh, true. So. <laughs> but yeah, on the uh, that, that uh, effort, uh, you know, the, the, I agree it's probably going to always be exponential, but, you know, we might be able to get some good approximations. But even given that, the thing that I find very problematic with this is if I'm going to do a stochastic optimization, I'm not sure what the prices mean. Because, uh, I mean, FERC was looking at this a while back. We were saying, let's look at stochastic optimization. And I talked to a few of the people presenting. I was saying, can you show me you, you get prices which are going to be, even assuming convexity, that this is going to be revenue adequate, everything will be working fine? And they said, yes. And I asked them, well, wait a minute. What happens if I'm on... Uh, I'm, I'm thinking I'm, I move off a different path. Oh, it'll be a revenue adequate in expectation. And I was saying, no, that's nice. You're telling me that I have to believe the ISO's uh, probability distribution. And even if I believe it, that you know, I may lose a lot of money initially, but sooner or later the sky will open up. But by then I may be bankrupt. 
So I'm saying there's just some fundamental issues with saying we're going to go to stochastic optimization and fix it. It doesn't sound like a market to me anymore. That's just my two cents. <laughs> it's ex precisely that concern, as, as Don pointed out, that led that led to the, I think, to the FlexiRAM product, right? Because um, the advisory interval, because of what's going on in advisory intervals, you'll be holding back some units now, and you could say, well, the advisory interval indicates you're going to get higher prices later, but you may not actually realize those. And um, for that reason, FRP was created to move some of those revenues up. Yeah, basically, you're getting paid your opportunity cost for holding that aside, and you, know, you should be okay. The problem is you're holding it at the wrong place. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you, Paul, for your perspective of that. So, you know, in the year uh, 2039, we'll check back with each other. And <laughs> again, God forbid we're all here, but. <laughs> Have we got an MSC date for that? No. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's see. So this is the last. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah no okay. Um, this is a Friday before a three-day weekend, and so it's understandable. So, uh, anything else within the room? And if not, nothing else on the phone. I think we're done. This is um, a very aggressive schedule. I understand for the FRP. We'll probably be hearing again soon. Uh, we have scheduled the next MSC meeting for December 6th, but be before then we'll be uh, considering having a call on the opinion uh, regarding system market power, so hopefully you hear you on the phones then. Um, but uh, there's a lot happening, so I think December 6th will be chock, chock full as will subsequent MSC meetings. So thank you, everybody, for coming out on this Friday before a three-day weekend. And, um, oh, let's see, any new business? 20 years, I've never seen any new business. So uh, thanks, everybody. Existing. Okay. Uh, okay. I think we're going to conclude. So. Thank you, Marco.